Thank you very much for inviting me today. My name is Mauro Zapatera, and I did my MD PhD at Harvard Medical School. During that time, I also studied polarity therapy, cranial sacral therapy, and Reiki. I now have a private practice in Pasadena, California, where I practice physical medicine and rehabilitation, and I also work in the Los Angeles VA healthcare system. The title of my talk today is The Cerebrospinal Fluid and I Am. The I Am to me is that inner sense of beingness, the inner perception of our existence. Numerous artists have depicted our energetic bodies manifesting as physical forms. Many times there appears to be a swirling or vortex of energy with a condensation or differentiation of energy from some source energy with a focal point at the center of, the, of our brain. Yogananda, who was an Indian yogi and guru known for many things, including the starting the Self-Realization Fellowship and his famous book, Autobiography of a Yogi, said this, the consciousness enters the body by way of the brain and spine. The fact remains we can never know anything except through the medium of the senses, so long as the life force remains trapped in the body. There is a way out, however. It is for the life force to merge with the cosmic energy, for the consciousness to merge in the infinite consciousness. The way to accomplish this end is to withdraw the life force from the senses and center it in the spine, to direct it upward through the spine to the brain and thence out through the Christ center between the eyebrows. The spine is the highway to the infinite. The spine and the brain are the altars of God. That's where the electricity of God flows down into the nervous system, into the world. And the searchlights of your senses are turned outwards. But when you will reverse the searchlights through Kriya Yoga, and be concentrated in the spine, you will behold the maker. That's what self-realization teaches. The technique of meditation, recharging the body battery with cosmic energy. For it is not a creed or dogma, but a science of soul and spirit. How the soul descended from the cosmic consciousness into the earth and the body and the senses is the purpose of this work. This presentation will be on the embryonic fluids and the cerebrospinal fluid as a potential conveyor of this energy to our physical body, essentially a bridge from the infinite to the finite. In your brain, there are fluid-filled ventricles, cavities. At the center of your brain, at the same location of your third eye, your brow center, there is a cavity called the third ventricle. The third ventricle is a midline space. Its boundaries are the pituitary gland in front, the pineal gland in back, and the thalamus and the hypothalamus on the sides. The space between these structures has been called the Crystal Palace by Taoists or the Cave of Brahma in some Hindu yogic traditions. This space is filled with fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid. What is the cerebrospinal fluid? The cerebrospinal fluid is a clear fluid that bathes the brain and the spine. It occupies the cavities within the brain called the ventricles, which you see here as a mold. It covers the outside of the brain. It travels all the way down the central canal of the spinal cord, and it bathes the outside of the spinal cord as well. At any one point in time, you have 150 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid in your body. It turns over approximately three to four times a day, and so therefore you make anywhere between 450 to 600 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid every day. You make half a liter of cerebrospinal fluid every day. So what you see here is a sagittal or side view of an MRI of an adult human. The cerebrospinal fluid is colored in red. From this image, you can see how it bathes the entire outside of the brain, as well as the spaces inside and the entire outside of the spinal cord. 
our central nervous system is floating in and being bathed by CSF. Interestingly, the spinal cord ends at about lumbar vertebra two, but the CSF goes all the way down into the sacrum. Keep this in mind for future slides. Our entire central nervous system is actually suspended in a column of fluid. The actual mass of the human brain is about 1,400 to 1,500 grams. However, the net weight of the brain suspended in the cerebrospinal fluid is equivalent to a mass of 25 to 50 grams. Your entire central nervous system is essentially suspended in this fluid. We have a column of fluid that is right in our midline structure. So where does this fluid come from? Well, that little black spot in the middle of that image is you. This was you as an embryo. You can see above that the amniotic fluid. Below that, you can see the yolk sac. And all around it, you can see the chorionic fluid. Look at how you are essentially developing surrounded by fluid, enclosed in fluid, and totally supported by fluid. You are organized and created with fluid. So where is the cerebrospinal fluid? Well, the cerebrospinal fluid comes from the amniotic fluid during a process called neurulation. Initially, you are a sheet of cells, seen there in the image, and the neural plate is an area of cells that undergoes a process called invagination and neurulation. What happens is that the neural plate invaginates and it forms the neural grooves and the neural folds. The neural folds then fuse, and on the outside of the neural plate, you are bathed in amniotic fluid. As that differentiates and you get that invagination, the folds coming up and the fusion, what you see in the middle actually becomes the cerebrospinal fluid. So the cerebrospinal fluid actually comes from the amniotic fluid during embryologic development. Your brain and spinal cord was organized around fluid while bathed in fluid. This is a scanning electron microscope image of a developing mouse as if you were floating in the amniotic cavity watching the folding of the embryo. Here we see the neural folds developing, those folds that you see coming out towards you. The process of fusion to create the spinal cord and the brain. In image 16S, we can see how most of the folds are fused, but there's still an open cavity. The amniotic fluid is on the outside, and the cerebrospinal fluid is on the inside, and the fluids can still mix. Once fusion is complete, such as 19S, there is no more mixture of the amniotic fluid on the outside, and now you have the cerebrospinal fluid on the inside. Initially, your embryonic brain is a hollow, fluid-filled vesicle with cerebrospinal fluid on the inside of the tube and amniotic fluid on the outside of the tube. As you develop, the brain and spinal cord enlarge and differentiate, and cerebrospinal fluid continues to bathe the inside and outside of your entire central nervous system. So here you are as a tiny embryo. As you start developing awareness, you are bathed in this primordial fluid in your mother's womb, starting with the amniotic fluid and slowly becoming the cerebrospinal fluid. Now in you, it bathes your entire central nervous system, inside and outside your brain, traveling all the way down around your spinal cord to your sacrum, as well as within a central hollow canal inside your spinal cord. So what is the role of the cerebrospinal fluid? Well, let's start evolutionarily. It is thought that the CSF system evolved as a way to receive signals from the environment required for the functioning of the nervous system. Evolutionarily, brain cells in the starfish that are making contact with the ocean water are very similar to the cells found on the neural plate of a developing mammalian embryo. 
throughout evolution, as there is more closure of this body plan, such as in sea worms, there is an internal seawater within the nervous system of the worm and an external seawater on the outside of the worm, still with the mixing of fluids as the cells contacting the internal seawater are similar to the cells found along the neural tube. This mixing of fluid from external and internal is similar to that of the cerebrospinal fluid and the amniotic fluid mixing in the womb. Therefore, evolutionarily, seawater is the first internal fluid environment of the brain. These cells that contact the surrounding fluid have a special role of receiving and transforming inf information from the fluid, whether that is ocean water, like in a starfish, or cerebrospinal fluid in vertebrates. Our ancestral seawater is CSF. So how did I become so fascinated with the CSF? It started with looking at this slide. This is a section through the head of a human embryo at eight weeks of development. Here you see the developing brain. It is a thin structure on top. I did not know what this cauliflower-like structure was seemingly floating in space. So I asked my colleague who told me that was the choroid plexus. Well, the choroid plexus produces CSF. If the structure that makes the CSF was that large, then the CSF must have an important role. Essentially, our entire developing nervous system is bathed in cerebrospinal fluid that you see in blue. From our research and other people's research, we can say that the cerebrospinal fluid provides essential survival and growth factors to the embryonic and adult brain. That the CSF provides a fluid niche for neural stem cells for proliferation, survival, and differentiation. So from a biological, purely molecular perspective, the information in the CSF, whether that information is coming from a protein, a hormone, a growth factor, or any molecule is actually being conveyed to the brain via the fluid. We published an article in the journal Neuron and we designed the cover image that was based on our vision of the CSF. What you see here is a continuum from embryo to adult. This changing color can represent the changing proteins and growth factors that are found in the cerebrospinal fluid from development to adult. But the blue essence, the light of the CSF, this represents a continuum of energy within the fluid that is ever present regardless of age. So the majority of the roles of the CSF that are known about today are that it transports nutrients and hormones to the central nervous system, regulates circadian rhythm, regulates appetite, provides guiding cues for cell migration, instructs stem cells to proliferate or differentiate, creates an ionic balance, eliminates waste, supports and protects the central nervous system, and provides a buoyancy and shock absorber for the brain. But what else could it do? Martin Marzullo, who's the director of Heart Mind Institute, says this, the CSF is not the cause of kundalini, it's the vehicle for the kundalini energy as it courses through the body. Here are two quotes by Dr. Randolph Stone, the founder of Polarity Therapy, a holistic healthcare system. He says the cerebrospinal fluid, the soul swims in the cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid seems to act as a storage field and a conveyor for the ultrasonic and light energy. Dr. Sutherland said this that Dr. Still said about the cerebrospinal fluid. Dr. Still envisioned the cerebrospinal fluid as an intermediary in the movement of divine intelligence, a channeling of creation into the embryological segments and irrigating them with life, giving form and function and order and intelligence to our existence. As a fluid, the CSF can be a sensitive receiver and transmitter of energy, vibrations, and information. Just as flower remedies demonstrate that water is able to absorb, store, and transmit the energy as, of plants. Or, as Dr. Masuro Emoto showed that water could store the energy of words, so also the cerebrospinal fluid may absorb, store, and transmit the essence of the source and allow us to experience and be aware or conscious 
of our beingness. As I mentioned, the cerebrospinal fluid covers the entire outer surface of the brain. Let's take a look at where the cerebrospinal fluid is stored inside the brain and allow the structure to guide us. It is stored in what's called the ventricles of the brain. These are fluid-filled spaces. On the left, you see an image of the brain as if it's looking towards you. The blue is where the cerebrospinal fluid is held. On the, on the right, you see an image of the brain on its side as if it's looking to the left. Those are the ventricles as they appear inside the brain. Why, does the, why are the ventricles of the brain form the way they are? Why does the lateral ventricle make contact with the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe of the brain? Why does the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle need to send a projection to contact the visual areas of the brain? Look at the third ventricle in the middle. This is a midline space. Why does the third ventricle have these two beaks, one that contacts the pituitary gland and the other one that contacts the pineal gland? It's like it has to make contact with these essential glands. So let's allow the structure to guide us in understanding its function. So what do the cells look like that contact the CSF? Well, this is a scanning electron microscope image of the wall of the ventricle, the inside of the ventricle making contact with the CSF. What we see is that the walls of the ventricles that are contacting the CSF has these cilia, or slender hair-like structures. The cilia can beat to actually create fluid movements. They are also like little antenna monitoring the fluid that have receptors on them to pick up information in the cerebrospinal fluid. So what's, what receptors are found on these cells? There are photoreceptors that transmit light. There are chemoreceptors that transmit information from growth factors, ions, hormones, and mechanoreceptors that transmit information from flow, movement, and vibrations. So the CSF can transmit information from light, vibration, movement, and molecules. Just to give you a sense, two important molecules that are found in the CSF are melatonin and DMT, each derived from tryptophan and believed to be released by the pineal gland into the CSF. Melatonin regulates sleep-wake cycles and circadian rhythms. DMT is found widespread in the plant kingdom as DMT-containing plants are commonly used in shamanic ritual that can produce powerful psychedelic near-death and mystical experiences. The endogenous function of DMT is still trying to be understood. Recent research has shown DMT to, to be produced in the pineal gland, choroid plexus, and brain, and was increased in the visual cortex of the brain of rats during cardiac arrest, hypothesized to be involved in near-death experiences. Imagine, therefore, the CSF as a vehicle for transmission of information quickly. Something gets released into the CSF and can transmit that signal to multiple parts of the brain and spine simultaneously without any synapses, with a total synchronization of that information. This can include a molecule such as melatonin or DMT, a growth factor for brain development or health, or a frequency and vibration for a felt sense of our connection to source energy. It is my hypothesis that the biological occurrence of a kundalini awakening is the rising of sacred energy from the sacrum to the head through the cerebrospinal fluid. Let's take a look at this closer. The kundalini in yogic theory is a primal energy located at the, at the base of the spine. Some say residing in the sacrum, like a sleeping serpent waiting to be awakened. From yogic practice, kundalini is awakened and physically moves up a central canal, the shashumna, to reach the third eye and subsequently the, the crown chakra for awakening to occur. Could the CSF be a transporter for this primal energy? Well, let's take a look at some of the anatomy. 
The sacrum is a large triangular bone at the base of the spine. The origin of the word comes from the Latin os sacrum, which means sacred bone. The end of the spinal cord is approximately at L2, and the CSF goes all the way down to about sacral level two or three. Interestingly, there's a filament called phylum terminale that goes all the way down from the bottom of the spinal cord to the coccyx. Remember, within the spinal cord, there's a canal filled with fluid that goes all the way up the spinal cord to the third ventricle. Some people claim there is a small fiber within the central canal of the spinal cord made of condensed CSF protein that goes to the pineal gland called Reisner's fiber. Here are the words of Swami Vivekananda. According to the yogis, there are two nerve currents in the spinal column called Pingala and Ida, and a hollow canal called Shashumna running through the spinal cord. At the lower end of the hollow canal is what the yogis call the lotus of the kundalini. They describe it as triangular in form, in which, in the symbolic language of the yogis, there is a power called the kundalini coiled up. When that kundalini awakens, it tries to force a passage through this hollow canal, and as it rises, step by step, as it were, layer after layer of the mind becomes open, and all the different visions and wonderful powers come to the yogi. When it reaches the brain, the yogi is perfectly detached from the body and mind, and the soul finds itself free. The left is the ida, the right pingala, and that hollow canal which runs through the center of the spinal cord is the shushumna. Where the spinal cord ends in some of the lumbar vertebra, a fine fiber issues downward, and the canal runs up even within that fiber, only much finer. The canal is closed at the lower end, which is situated near what is called the sacral plexus. Vivekananda mentions the Ida, Pingala, and Shushumna. These are the three main nadis. Nadi comes from the Tamil, meaning nerve, blood vessel, or pulse, and Sanskrit, meaning channel, stream, or flow. Ida lies to the left of the spine, Pingala to the right of the spine, and the Shushumna runs along the center of the spinal cord. Some images have the Ida and the Pingala doing a helix crossing, the Shushumna, and at each intersection would be a chakra. To me, the Ida and the Pingala represent the pineal and the pituitary glands. The Shushumna coming up from the center of the spine in the tube full of cerebrospinal fluid, all meeting at the third ventricle, the fluid-filled radiant space in the middle of our head, the crystal palace the cave of Brahma. It is the space where the marriage of the yin and the yang energies of the pineal gland and the pituitary gland come to form a perfect harmony. It is my belief that this is the place for the birth of the I am in physical form, where through dispersion of the energy within the fluid, our entire brain is simultaneously bathed with the differentiated energy from the source, providing the synchronous unified experience and awareness of our true essence. Another practice related to the CSF is the Kachari Mudra. This is a yoga practice where the tongue is rolled up to touch the hard or soft palate. Then with practice, it is inserted into the nasal cavity behind the palate. This may take months or years of practice. Once inside the nasal cavity, the tongue can stimulate nerve centers that are connected to the brain. This produces a liquid that emanates from the roof of the cavity. A nectar, or amrit, flows from the roof of the nasal cavity. Amrit is a word from Sanskrit, meaning without death or immortal, which bestows immortality. This mudra has been described to allow people to experience the vast expanse of consciousness. So how is this all connected to the CSF? Well, this muscular-like structure that you see in the mouth is the tongue. The little lip in the back is the uvula. Up at top, you see the cribriform plate, which is a bone. The cribriform plate is where the olfactory bulb actually sends its nerves through, and the olfactory bulb, the nerves are coming through the cribriform 
plate, bathing the olfactory bulb and very well capable of coming through the cribriform plate is the cerebrospinal fluid. Here you see the pituitary gland on the right-hand side of that image. Could the amrate or nectar be the cerebrospinal fluid? I believe that it may. Many people have asked me what causes the cerebrospinal fluid to move. My theories, in addition to the ones that we're gonna go on, are any sort of parasympathetic activity, such as rest, meditation, craniosacral therapy, massage, movement, such as dance, exercise, yoga, vibration, such as sound and light, visualized intention, and love. Given the potential that CSF is activated by light and sound, one of my business partners and I created the Metatronics Vibrational Medicine Light and Sound Machine depicted here. Essentially, meta is beyond, tron is subatomic particle, so it's beyond the subatomic particle, beyond form. A machine that works on the energetic levels and vibrational levels prior to form. So what causes the CSF to move from a, what has been shown in the research? Well, the research shows that the heartbeat has been shown to move the cerebrospinal fluid. Sleep has been shown to move the cerebrospinal fluid through the brain tissue. However, one of the major drivers of CSF movement is our breath. This is an MRI image of the brain. And in image D there, you see that is the image of what is enlarged in, in image B. That is an enlarged view of the third ventricle. Here is a series of pictures depicting the CSF flow, which is the bright spot that you see coming into the third ventricle during forced inspiration. This depicts one inspiration lasting 2.5 seconds. So it'd be something like this. Inspiration actually drives the CSF into the third ventricle, the cave of Brahman, the fluid filled space in the center of the brain. This is a diagram of the CSF flow during forced breathing at each spinal level. The bars above the line indicate movement towards the head and the bars below the line indicate movement towards the sacrum. The IN in red is forced inspiration and the EX in blue is expiration. The red bars show that forced inspiration leads to an upward flow of CSF at all spinal levels that were tested. The blue bars show that, there's, that forced expiration leads to a downward flow only in the mid and lower spinal cord regions. The amount of research that is coming out in regards to breath work and brain activity is incredible. We now know that your breath can actively modulate CSF flow. Imagine any breath work that you do, whether it's holotropic breath work, Wim Hof method, pranayama breathing, or simply taking deep breaths to relax. And imagine actively moving your CSF with your breath within your spine and brain, opening up to the possibility of cosmic consciousness dispersing throughout your being with the movement of this cerebrospinal fluid. Our central nervous system is in an entire column of fluid. This fluid may be an intermediary between the infinite and the finite, a condensation of a less condensed form of energy, a breathing. By breathing, we can create a rhythm in the fluid, an undulating process with oscillations. This has the ability to bring vibrations and energy frequency to the fluid, which can transmit the rhythms of life and the rhythms of the infinite. Evolutionarily, the CSF system evolved as a way to receive signals and transmit information. Our ancestral CSF is seawater. So connect to the fluid that surrounded you as an embryo, to the fluid that is bathing the inside and outside of your entire central nervous system right now, to all the fluid in all the oceans that have ever been present in history.
The fluid is bathing the inside and outside of your brain and spine. Imagine it being a perfect vehicle to transmit information to the brain, whether that is melatonin to help us sleep or DMT, or as a fluid conductor of source energy to our physical bodies to transmit the experience of I am, our beingness, as well as a vehicle of cosmic consciousness, that awareness of the universal mind and one's unity with it. I'd like to acknowledge my wife, Cami Zapatera, for being my soulmate and my life partner, my son and my daughter, Mike and Ananda Mai, Linda and Michael Molina for putting this symposium together, the Emerging Sciences Foundation, Nisargadatta Maharaj, Maria Lettinen and Chris Walsh, who were instrumental in my PhD work, Dr. Randolph Stone for being the founder of Polarity Therapy, Jeannie Kerrigan and Jeffrey Wilson, my polarity teachers, all of you, the CSF and life. Here's my website and my Instagram account. If you have any questions, please send me an email. Thank you very much.